coming. Thank you for sharing an hour, an hour and a half, half with me as we talk about uh, cities and their, and their comebacks. I'm always delighted to be at any event for Center for Cities, which is a terrific organization. We share in common a, a love for and a fascination uh, with the world's great urban areas. Of course, uh, we're, in, we're in certainly one of, the, one of the greatest of them. Now, um, I find comeback cities, I find this topic so fascinating because this was an experience that I had in my life, that I was born in Manhattan in 1967 and experienced uh, the perilous decline of this once mighty metropolis during the 1970s. And these are two iconic images from the New York City of my youth. And I think just to take you back there, you can, those of you who remember, London had its dark days as well during the 70s and 80s, which I also uh, remember, perhaps not as well. But hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs in New York were lost in a short span of years. Because in fact, the largest industrial cluster in the United States in the 1950s was not automobile production in Detroit. It was garment production in New York City. And it was hammered by globalization. Accompanying that was spiraling social distress, crime rates that were out of control, a city that couldn't uh, manage its books. And it was on the verge of bankruptcy when it came to Washington to ask for help. Um, you can see Ford's response there. He, he didn't literally tell the city to drop dead, but I think many people think that he actually meant it. And certainly in those years, it, it felt not just that history itself, uh, not just that Ford, but that history itself was telling New York to drop dead, that the age of the great city had come and gone. And in those years, in an American perspective, you know, Boston looked just as dead as Buffalo, Seattle looked just as dead as St. Louis. Right? This was an age in which all of American cities looked as if they were dinosaurs headed for the trash heap of history. And you can see here President Jimmy Carter wandering through the wasteland that the South Bronx had become, when it really seemed possible as if those, the weeds were going to come out of the ground and reclaim the towers of the city, and we'd be looking forward to a future in which the Statue of Liberty would be peeping out of the sand as it does at the end of the, the Planet of the Apes, uh, a great uh, cultural episode from that period. Now, today, of course, that's not what New York City uh, feels like. It's not what London feels like. And we're back in a world in which London and New York are, are jostling with each other for the title of capital of the universe in, in, some, in some way. And then we're all feeling very good about these cities. Um, but of course, that's not the universal experience of American cities. Right? And it's not the universal experience of UK cities either. Right? I mean, there are maybe green shoots in places like Liverpool and, and Manchester and Birmingham, but it, you know, unemployment rates remain double the national average. And nothing that you have here equals the feeling that you get in, uh, in Detroit, where you know, the city just actually did go into bankruptcy last year. Um, it's a place in which you can wander through great swaths of the city and you feel like you are in an empty moonscape. Right? I, I, you know, it, do, it doesn't feel like the dangerous parts of New York from the 1970s. It just feels vacant. And it's very much an area in which the city doesn't feel like it has come back. It's not clear if it can come back. Um, and that heterogeneity, the fact that some cities have come roaring back so much while other ones have not, in some sense, it makes this topic so fascinating. And I'm just going to take you through a little bit of a tour where we're going to ask a number of questions. The first two are largely of factual interest, largely of historical interest, which is, why did so many cities decline? Uh, the second city the question is, why did some but not all cities come back? And I'm going to be showing you data both from the US and data from the UK, made possible, of course, by the fantastic data tool on the Center for Cities website. Of course, I have taken their very elegant data tool and then put it through my wonky uh, statistical program, so it no longer looks pretty at all, but uh, sorry. Uh, it's just to make you more grateful for what you get from the Center for Cities. Then I'm going to ask two separate questions. The first question is, what do I think the U.S. government should be doing about declining cities? And I'm going to separate that out from what I think the U.K. government should be doing about declining cities, because I think they're actually different, and that's, that's the spoiler. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time before doing that about talking about why I think the U.S. and U.K. are in fact different, and that the you know, glibly heartless recommendations that I often give in the U.S. are probably not the right answer, or not completely the right answer for the U.K. Now, just to put the extent of America's urban decline in perspective, these were the ten largest American cities in 1950. Eight of these ten have lost at least 20% of their population. Three of them, like Liverpool, have lost more than 50% of their population. Cleveland, Detroit, and St. Louis, right, which are shadows of their former self. Now, there's something misleading in this, because some of the cities that have lost 23% of their population, like uh, Boston, uh, are actually doing relatively well. Boston's actually doing extremely well. 
Um, but in fact, all of them are much smaller uh, than they once were. Now, in some sense, the background for this urban decline is the urban success of the 19th century. So if we go back historically to the world of you know, Matthew Bolton's Birmingham or Alexander Hamilton's New York, cities were, unless they were imperial capitals, were modestly sized by modern standards. And they were marked when they were successful by three things, smart people, small firms, and connections to the outside world, right? You can't think of a smarter collection of people than the set of people coming around the, the Lunar Society in, in Birmingham or in, you know, in Glasgow in the era of, of James Watt's youth. Um, and, but then all of a sudden, this sort of remarkable thing became this rise of the great industrial city. In the US, it happened on a truly spectacular scale because we're, we were a much flatter landscape. And the precondition for growth, which was the sort of transportation cost advantages of the US became far more important. And that's, that's really the backdrop for this image, which is the great stockyards of Chicago. And the stockyards were about industrial food production on a massive scale, um, made possible by the refrigerated rail cars of armor. Now, if we want to go back further and sort of understand the difference of this, let's go back to Arkwright, let's go back to this is the Soho manufacturing, let's go back to the, the start of the Industrial Revolution which of course happens here, and it happens because of smart people who borrow ideas from each other, who figure out how to use traditional modes of English craftsmanship to then move things on a larger scale, right? Watt isn't able to get his separate condenser steam engine to work properly in Glasgow because he doesn't have the metalworking capacity to actually do it. It's when he gets to Birmingham and is able to use centuries of metallurgical skills of Wilkinson and his, his ability to actually able to create this amazing thing of the separate condenser steam engine. Um, and of course, the UK ends up having great industrial cities. But for many reasons, they become less extreme than the US. There are many things that are similar. They're built often around ports. Think of Liverpool, of course, which is the opposite side of the, the crossing the Atlantic. And of course, you know, every one of the 20 largest cities in the US in 1900 was on a major waterway. Um, because in the age before cheap transportation, we clustered our manufacturing around, around uh, our ports. You know, every one of the three largest American industries during the, 1900, during the 1800s was built around the port. And those being uh, the, the garment trade, which worked on the textiles that were coming in and catered to sailors and other customers. Sugar <coughs> refining, which was in fact the largest industry by value added in the early, early uh, ages of the 19th century, and that related to trade with the Caribbean. And of course, my favorite New York example of an industry built around the port is printing and publishing. Because of course, the big money in 19th century printing and publishing in the US was in pirated English novels. And the whole deal is if you're going to steal <coughs> books from people, you actually have to be the first thief. Because there's no percentage in, in printing the eighth pirated edition of J.K. Rowling's latest novel. You actually have to be the first one out. And that's exactly what the port gave uh, Harper Brothers with the ability to get the book and flood the, flood the market with it. Um, and uh, the cities grew up around it. But of course, things happened on a grander scale in the US, in part because it was a larger market, in part because industrialization happened somewhat later, in part because the cities were being built on a much you know, greener landscape, and it was much less than that on the city. There were fewer traditional city structures. And so you could have a city like Detroit that emerged almost out of nowhere right, to become America's great industrial powerhouse. And I just want to sort of walk you through a little bit of, of Detroit's DNA. So Detroit is, of course, yet another port. It's a great inland, inland waterway, Detroit, the Straits. And it is a place where cities then and now service places where young people go and learn things. When you look at urban wages, it's not that when people come to cities, they immediately have a 30% jump up in their wages. What you see is that year by year, month by month, they have faster wage growth, which I think is compatible with the view that cities are forges of human capital, places where we get smart by being inundated with a maelstrom of economic activity. And that's exactly what happens to the young Henry Ford. He comes to Detroit and starts working on a Detroit dry dock, a, a shipping, a ship producing company. That's where he learns about engines. And then he joins in this, he works for Thomas Alva Edison, learns a bit of the entrepreneurial innovator business. And then he joins in this great American quest to produce the mass produced car. And Detroit is filled with these car producing entrepreneurs in the, in the 1890s. It's not just about Ford, it's about the Dodge brothers, the Fisher brothers, David Dunbar Buick, Billy Durant, Ransom E. Olds, right? all of whom knew each other. And that's, of course, what cities do that really matters. It connects humanity with each other, 
it enables the collaborative chains of creativity that are responsible for, for humanity's greatest hits from Athenian philosophy to Facebook. Right? It's what cities do that's important. And exactly what happened when Detroit was a land of small-scale entrepreneurs. In some sense, the tragedy for Detroit is the big idea was this, right? Forge River Rouge plant, a vast vertically integrated, vertically integrated operation employing tens of thousands of less skilled people. On one level, in the short run, this was a fantastic innovation, right? Cheap mobility for ordinary American farmers, high wages, five dollar days for the workers. Detroit itself transformed into the you know industrial heartland of, of the United States. The, the mega power that enabled America to produce vast numbers of airplanes and tanks during World War II. In the short run, an incredibly productive thing. And it grew on a vast scale. But in the long run, this is a terrible model for urban survival. Because these factories don't need the city, they don't give to the city, they aren't integrated in the city. When cost conditions change, you just move the factory somewhere else. So the cities that are built around these giant industrial operations prove to be very brittle when conditions change. And that's exactly what happened, partially because of the car. So whereas in 1910 and 1920, it made sense for Henry Ford to have his car factories in Detroit. Um, by 1960, he didn't, because the cost conditions had changed. Partially, overwhelmingly perhaps, because it became cheap to ship goods. Right? In 1816, it cost as much to good, ship goods 30 miles over land in the US as it did to ship them across the entire Atlantic Ocean. Right? Distance was, was absolutely king. By 1900, distance was significantly less brutal, but it was still important to be near the Great Lakes, to be near the rail network. By 1960, it was irrelevant. And Ford's cars, Ford's engines, were part of that. And this is the, the rise of the, the interstate highway system that was part of that. This is the decline in the real cost of moving a ton of mile by rail. So you move factories, first to suburbs, then to you know, lower cost states. The work of Tom Holmes compares um, counties that are on pro-business sides of state lines, counties that are on pro-labor sides of state lines, and shows the huge industrial shift after World War II to the pro-business sides of state lines, made possible by declining transportation costs, and then, of course, the move across the ocean. Now, this had a huge effect on the former industrial cities. And as I said, New York counts as one of those. It happened to be more resilient because it was older, because it had a wider variety of activities. But they all got hammered because they all did the industrial thing. And as industry suburbanized, and in 1950, seven out of the eight largest American cities were over-concentrated in, in industry. By 1990, six out of the eight largest American cities were under-concentrated in industry, meaning they had less industry than the US did as a whole. You also had these declining transportation costs enabled a whole shift of America to warmer locales. Right? So whereas the, the dominant city in 1900 was in a place where production had an advantage, perhaps because of proximity to Pittsburgh's coal mines, by 2000, it had moved to places which people wanted to live. And apparently the things Americans really wanted was warmer winters. Because I know of no variable that better predicts metropolitan area growth during the 20th century in the US than January temperatures. Um, it turns out that January temperature is also powerful within the EU. Um, it, it is mildly powerful in the, in, the, in the UK, but it's much weaker, in part because your climate differences are so much smaller. And I'll come back to that in, in the end. It's one of the huge differences between the US and the UK when we think about regional regeneration and the chances of places like Manchester, Birmingham. The fact that they aren't starting with a huge climate-related burden, as Detroit does, is actually a huge plus for these areas. But nonetheless, you know, people have to like warmth in the EU uh, as well. Um, along with the move to sun is the move to sprawl. Now, um, we were just talking about Milton Keynes earlier. Uh, this is not Milton Keynes. Uh, this is Levittown, and this is the woodlands outside of Houston. And it's always true that we have built our new urban spaces around the transportation technology that was dominant in the era in which they were rebuilt. Our oldest urban spaces are built around walking. Our 19th century urban spaces were built around streetcars for a variety of forms, or trams. And then our 20th century new spaces in the U.S. were built around cars. Uh, it shouldn't surprise us. The average commute by car in the U.S. is 24 minutes. The average commute by public transit is 48 minutes. It's not surprising that Americans like, like the car. However, it's, you know, it ended up being hugely problematic that we ended up subsidizing the car. Each new highway that cut into a metropolitan area after World War II reduced the central city's population by about 18% relative to the metropolitan area as a whole, uh, at least according to Nate Mount Snow's uh, work. Um, and indeed, as we know, the car is also associated with very significant environmental consequences that we haven't fully managed to internalize. Now, the Detroit story is you know, mirrored on this side of the, of the planet. 
on this side of the, of the pond. I mean, the, the, I think I was last in Liverpool about five or six years ago during the time in which it was a capital of culture. And you have this sort of, at least I, I felt this juxtaposition, which is backed up by the data, of shiny stuff going on on the waterfront, and you see this in Detroit, Detroit as well, mixed with very persistent poverty in the interior of, of the city, which shows up again in the, in the data. It's not anywhere near as severe as Detroit is. It's not. A, it's not. Doesn't feel anything. Anything like that in terms of intractability. But it still is the ongoing legacy of having been an industrial powerhouse built around a port that became much less important and much less labor intensive over the 20th century. Um, and indeed, all of these places are hit also by this. You know, not just the moving of manufacturing, but the replacement of capital for labor within manufacturing, which has been a feature of all rich countries. Now, I'm going to give you some ugly graphs now. And um, this comes from the Center for Cities data. And these are just a couple of ways of thinking about the phenomenon of the heterogeneity within the UK and, and within the US. I'll go back and forth between UK and US data. This just shows the relationship between gross value added per worker, a measure of productivity, and population growth between 1981 and 2013 by Center for Cities, Cities definitions. And my point here, of course, is Milton Keynes up here in its own little world. Uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the point here is that there are a whole bunch of places that are down here both low in terms of productivity and low in terms of population growth. That this, is a, that this is the issue that we're talking about. And, and that there is, these things tend to go together, and you can see that quite clearly uh, there. Um, growth and decline are persistent. And in part, this reflects the durable nature of housing. When you build housing, you don't abandon it overnight. And what happens in the US, in, in Detroit, is for decades, right, housing prices fall, they fall below new construction costs, but the houses remain, and people still remain in the houses for decades after, after the decline begins, which is why population growth tends to be very, very persistent. So this is 80s and the 90s, and as you can see, it's a very close fit. This is the fit in the UK. This is 81 to 2001 versus 2003 to 2013. It's not as persistent as in the US. But you don't go wrong betting that the places that were growing in the, in the recent past will be growing in the future. Over longer time horizons, there is some degree of mean reversion. But in decade on decade, it's not as if the places that were having trouble in the 80s and 90s suddenly soared ahead and ended up, ended up leading the UK, UK uh, in terms of population growth. <laughs> Manufacturing is not, you know, completely determinative, but it's a strong negative predictor. And again, I wish I had manufacturing in 1950. I could show you this for the US, manufacturing in 1950 and growth in recent decades. I just have from the, from the Center for Cities data recent manufacturing shares. But as you can see, manufacturing is predictive of decline. The manufacturing cities are the ones that are doing work as well. And of course, this is you know um, the connection between social distress. And it's put as the employment rate, but you really shouldn't be interested in the employment rate. You should be interested in one minus the employment rate, the share of people who are not, uh, not employed, the jobless. And what this is reminding us is the very strong relationship between population growth and the employment rate, or rather put the other way, population decline and joblessness. And certainly, when I think about what are both the US and the UK and the EU's largest social problems, I do not think that there is one that is more important and harder to solve than longer term joblessness. In fact, this is the this is the, the biggest thing that we have in terms of in terms of the challenges ahead. Um, there's even a relationship, and this remarkably shows up both for the uh, US and the UK, between unhappiness and decline. And this is a map of self-reported life satisfaction across the US. Uh, there's some interesting features here. So New York, despite the fact that, you know, uh, uh, it's such a successful city, actually has very low levels of self-reported happiness. Now, I happen to think that this is cultural, but anyone, you know, anyone who's ever watched a Woody Allen movie or known a New Yorker knows that no self-respecting New Yorker is going to admit to some interviewer that they're happy. It's kind of like admitting that you're an idiot, right? I mean, it's a, it's a, uh, um, but, uh, and New York, of course, has very low suicide rates. The same phenomenon shows up in London, by the way. Also, relatively low levels of self-reported happiness and very low levels of, of suicide. Um, but across the country as a whole, there's this very strong relationship between population growth and happiness, or rather, to be more precise, there's nothing out here where you're comparing the growing cities with the super growing cities, but down here, there's a woeful negative relationship. So the declining cities really are, are, do report much lower levels of unhappiness. And this is true in four different data sets. Um, this is the UK version. So each one of those dots is a different local authority. So I have local authorities data from ONS. The, the UK data is messier than the US for a number of reasons, one of which is I haven't been able to control for individual characteristics the way I have in the US data. But it shows the same uh, nonlinear pattern, that in fact it's flat for growth, 
Uh, I mean, Milton Keynes isn't off the roof in terms of happiness, which is what it would be if it were. Um, but down here, there is the same sort of strong negative relationship. The places that are really declining uh, are unhappy. Now, interestingly, when you go back historically, so I have two data sets that link me go, to go back to the 70s and even to the 40s. These places were unhappy first before they were declining. That in fact, it wasn't that the US cities you know, suddenly became unhappy because they were declining. It's that, in fact, they were never particularly happy places. That Detroit in the 40s does not appear to have been a place of great joy. That, in fact, who knew? Working in a coal mine in Scranton or working in a blast furnace in Ford didn't necessarily make you jump up with joy every day in your, in your, in your life. But, in fact, the workers in those were well paid for that. So I, I think the right view of things is these industrial cities in their heyday were not places of great pleasure. They were places of great productivity. And workers came and put up with it because they were able to earn a better future for their children. They were, earning, they were able to put bread on the table. Um, what's happened is people have gotten richer, both in the US and the UK, is that we've been, people have been more willing to sacrifice earnings for a better quality of life. And that is what this move to California was all about. It wasn't that the Midwestern farmers who started going to Los Angeles at the start of the 20th century thought they were going to be earning more money than they were in Iowa. They went there because it was just a lot nicer from their, from their perspective. And when we have measures of amenities, and this is this amenity index, which is basically just how uh, we measure amenities by just how expensive the place is relative to how much money you earn, figuring that places that really cost a lot to live in but don't provide high wages have got to have something else nice going for them. Um, if you do that in 1980, it's very predictive of subsequent population growth. So, move to amenities, move away from older industrial cities. Um, not much of that come back as well. But I think that's the right, that's the right model for where, why the decline occurred. You had industrial cities that were built often in unpleasant places, often in un unpleasant ways. The need for manufacturing in the cities disappeared. The one-time transportation cost advantages that they enjoyed vanished. We rebuilt our car, our cities from public transportation to the car. The exodus occurred. Okay. But here's the remarkable thing. In the 1970s, when we thought all of these cities were dead, right, in 1971, two jokers put up a billboard on the highway leaving Seattle asking the last person to leave the city to please turn out the lights. Right? We weren't able to distinguish between which cities would succeed and which ones didn't. And in fact, people thought that all of them were dead. But that's not what happened. That some cities, New York, London, Seattle, Boston, San Francisco, have done remarkable jobs of coming back. What actually explains it? Well, in a statistical sense, the strongest variable that you can use among these older, colder cities is skills. That skills are destiny. It turns out the cities which had lots of education, that had human capital, that Seattle had Boeing, and Boeing meant engineers. And the reason why the, the jokers put up a sign on Seattle's you know, highway saying thing that the last person should turn up lights is because Boeing was cutting back on the number of jobs. And you know what? If Seattle had only had Boeing, it wouldn't have survived. But it turned out that Boeing employed engineers. And those engineers then attracted Amazon when Amazon wanted to start up. And you know, there's this whole cluster of entrepreneurship, Costco, Starbucks, um, Microsoft, that you know, came about in part because of this skill-intensive culture that was part of Seattle's DNA. Uh, the work of Enrico Moretti looks at the presence of land-grant colleges. These are federally subsidized in the 19th century institutions which got land and were able to use the land to then teach people uh, of college age uh, skills. Often they were very pragmatic skills. The presence of these land grant colleges is very predictive of urban resilience and urban success over the last 30 years, whether measured by wages or measured by population growth. Boston's own land grant colleges, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which I am somewhat ashamed to admit as a Harvard professor, certainly did much more in creating, Har uh, creating Boston's economic resurgence than Harvard did in terms of its role in the economic ecosystem. Now, this is skills, share the population of college degree and population growth between 2000 and 2010. As you can see, average population growth is about 13% in the most skilled fifth of America's, uh, America's counties, and it's 3% in the least skilled fifth of America's counties. Um, this is skills and growth in the UK. Okay? The gap in, uh, in growth is still quite considerable. It's, uh, we're measuring it with Level four or more quals, um, again, coming from the Center for Cities data set, it's the same very robust statistical relationship. Now, what I haven't been able to do for the UK, which I can do for the US, is I can take skills in 1940 and it predicts subsequent success. I can take measures of skill from the 19th century and they predict subsequent success. And I haven't, I haven't been able to do this. You, you don't have the number of congregationalists in 1860 on your website yet, uh, which is, uh, but um, it, it does for the US. And, 
This is skills and price growth for the U.S. Now, there are actually two things that are going on, that are going on here. That skilled people both make for, actually, three things. I mean, people often want skilled neighbors. Skilled people <coughs> tend to lead to more productivity growth in the area. And you know what? Skilled people are also really good at shutting down new housing projects. That actually skilled areas are great at NIMBYism, which also contributes to housing price growth. But as you can see, this is, again, a very tight uh, fit of the change in, in the price of housing between 1995 and 2013 and the level four qualifications data. Um, this is productivity and skills in the U.S. So this is not just about the fact that your skills make you more productive. It's about the fact that having skilled neighbors makes you more productive. And, and this is what economists call human capital uh, spillovers. It's the fact that as the share of adults in your metropolitan area with a college degree goes up by 10%, your earnings on average go up by 8% holding your years of schooling constant. That's the sort of rough, rough fact that you should have in mind. Because in fact, having smart people around you makes you smarter. It's what the great economist Alfred Marshall was talking about when he said that in dense clusters, the mysteries of the trade become no mystery, but are, as it were, in the air. Um, it's because skilled people will give you a job. Uh, and it's because, in fact, um, skilled people also actually tend to lead to better government in the US as well. There's less corruption and more skilled areas as well. Um, this is not a particularly surprising uh, phenomenon. What's surprising is it's gotten stronger over time. And deep, this is the, the sideline of what, what happened in the, since the 1980s and 1990s. And this is why skilled cities have come back and less skilled cities haven't. Is that what globalization and new technologies have done is that they've greatly increased returns to being smart, as well as creating a flat world. And that means that we can make stuff far away and ship it in easily. But if we want to come up with new ideas, if we want to be smart, we've got to be in the center of the action. And this is why cities that are about making stuff had so much trouble, and why cities that were about making ideas did not. And those cities that were able to transform themselves from making stuff to making ideas were the cities that managed to succeed. Um, you know, and I think that's likely to continue. The more complicated the world is, the more important face-to-face -face contact is. You know, anyone who's ever taught knows the hard part about teaching is not knowing your subject material. It's knowing whether or not anything you're saying is getting through. And we have, over thousands of years, or millions of years, evolved to have these remarkable cues for communicating comprehension and confusion that are lost when we're not in the same room with each other. And this is one of the reasons why being face-to-face -face is so important, and why, look, of all the companies in the world that should be able to enable long-distance learning, it's Google, right? And what does Google do? They build the Googleplex so everyone will be on top of each other. What does Marissa Meyer do at Yahoo? She bans people working at home because she believes that face-to-face -face contact is so, is so crucial. Um, okay, this is productivity skills in the UK. I don't see any difference. Right? These things are exactly the same. Skills are destiny, and this is true everywhere. It's actually much stronger in India, it's strong in China. I know of no place where this doesn't show up, and where the aggregate relationship between skills and productivity is much stronger than the individual relationship. In the US, you have, and I don't have 1940 data for the UK, you also have phenomenon that places that were initially more skilled have become more skilled. This is the growth of the share of the population with college degrees on the initial share of the population with more college degrees. So this is why historic skills are so powerful, because they predicted where more skilled people would come. Um, I'm going to skip over that. Finance, of course, has been particularly crucial. It's dangerous. It means that cities like New York, and I even fear London, have become, London is, is not quite as dependent on one industry as New York has become. And I think New York is very lucky to have finance. But at the height of the, the boom, 42% of the payroll on the island of Manhattan was in financial services. And the history of Detroit and many other single industry towns should lead us to be wary of over-domination of single industry. But we shouldn't be surprised why finance loves, loves New York, right? Finance is about knowledge. And in fact, you know, we shouldn't be surprised that the industry where you can make a fortune more quickly from having a little bit more information is also the industry that loves density most, that loves proximity most, which is you know, what this picture is about. This is Bloomberg's um, Wallace office at City Hall, which is based on the Wallace office at Bloomberg LLP, which is based on the Solomon Brothers trading floor. And in some sense, trading floors are an oddity. Here you have some of the wealthiest people on the planet who in normal industries would live like university deans surrounded by sort of large desks and protective assistants. And there they are on top of each other. Right? And why are they doing that? They're doing that, of course, because knowledge is more important than space. And this is fundamentally why the sun cities, why the skilled cities have come back, because knowledge is more important than space. Uh, these are knowledge services coming from Center for Cities and population growth 2003 to 2013. Again, strong, reliable relationship, just as in the US. Um, many new technologies have actually made cities better. This is Zipcar, the share car sharing service. And it builds itself as the harbinger of a sharing economy. <laughs> But you know, cities have always been about sharing, right? Urban restaurants are nothing more than a shared 
dining room and a shared kitchen, urban, you know, Lincolns and Fields, a shared, you know, a shared forest, a shared, back, a shared backyard. The difference is that new technologies make it easier to share more things. And uh, because, you know, if you tried to have a zip car in New York in the 1960s, 70s, you would go to, you know, Times Square and, and on a Sunday morning to pick up your car, and it'd be like a dead body in the trunk, right? <laughs> and it'd be really bad, and you wouldn't know who had something last, and it would be unpleasant. Now, on top of skills, it's not the skills that you learn in school, I think, that are mo most important. I think, you know, I'm always amazed that anything I say ever has any practical consequences whatsoever, if indeed they do, which I'm not so sure. Uh, but, you know, the real heart of urban skills are the skills that are learned on the street, as Alfred Marshall was talking about. And I can't think of any skill that is more important than the talent and inclination to be an entrepreneur for long-run urban resilience. This entrepreneurship is what Seattle was about. And uh, it's where part of the problem had with Detroit, that Detroit, because of the very success of Henry Ford and the Big Three, it became a city dominated by a few large companies instead of a city built on small, scrappy entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurship is human capital as well. It is a specific type of skill. It's not a different thing, but it is a skill that is particularly oriented towards finding new projects, finding new ways of making life work in the city. The economist Ben Chenitz was comparing New York and Pittsburgh in the 1950s, noting that New York appeared to be more resilient than Pittsburgh did even then. And he argued that this was a result of the entrepreneurship created by the industrial legacy of New York. The fact that New York had the garment trade, which was an industry with very few barriers to entry, where anyone with a good idea and a couple of sewing machines could get started. Whereas Pittsburgh had U U.S. Steel, an industry which was, you know, red company men. And the difference is when, you, when steel went down, those guys had no idea how to start something new. But the garment guys, they were starting movie studios. They were building skyscrapers. Today they'd be starting whatever internet company you wanted that, that would be doing it. Because these guys were, you know, entrepreneurial to the nth degree. It is remarkable given how mediocre our measures of entrepreneurship are that they are so predictive of employment resilience. So this is average establishment size across the U.S. These places have lots of um, little establishments. These places have, lot, have a few big establishments. Huge difference, about a threefold difference in employment growth between 1977 and 2010 between the places with lots of small scrappy firms versus the big ones. This is firm startups per hundred. I guess this is a uh, population growth from the Center for Cities data. This is small and medium enterprise density per 10,000 people and population growth from the Center for Cities data. The same fact is true, right? And I found it very reassuring that all these things that I thought I knew for the U.S. actually appear to be true for U.K. cities as well. Okay, so skills, entrepreneurship, right, amenities. These are the things that enable some cities to come back and not others. Now, stop with this for a second. These are, these are, these are facts. We have to meditate for a second on what makes the U.K. and U.S. different before we go into policy proposals. I want to say five things, five major differences. The economics look very similar. It's even similar for the French, believe it or not. And that, and that's, that feels like a totally different world. Um, <laughs> here are five gaps that are important. First of all, the geographic distances are vastly larger in the United States. This means the weather is vastly different. This also means that the ability of a city like Buffalo to be a back office for New York City is totally different than the ability of a city like Birmingham to be a back office for London because the scope of the land, of the distances are just much larger. Two, housing supply is ultimately much more restricted in the UK than it is in the US. The amount of land is less, and there's much less regional heterogeneity in building. This means that, in fact, you can have whole cities abandoned because we'll build some new thing in Texas. And, you know, that's just what the US will do. The US, politically, there are these two massive differences. The US has a very strong tradition of empowered local government. Some of them are very good, and some of them are very bad. Uh, but in any case, we have this strong tradition of, of it. National capacity, on the other hand, uh, which the UK does not have, national capacity, on the other hand, is by significantly higher in the UK than it is in the US. That your, the ability of your national government to do things just feels totally different than what we're able to do in Washington. And that, in part, reflects the relative balance of capacity in two areas. So just to remember you about distances, Detroit is competing against Miami. How far away is Detroit from Miami? 1,150 miles. Right? That's Tunis to London. Okay, that's, that's a huge amount of gap. Detroit to Los Angeles, that's 2,000 miles. These are on a different world. This is farther, 400 miles further than it would take to get you to Moscow, right? I mean, this is just a totally different world in terms of the, the landscapes, and the weather could not be more different. London to Liverpool, that's 200 miles. That's the difference between, between Hartford, Connecticut, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And everyone thinks that those two cities are both part of greater New York, okay? <laughs> so it, it's a, just a totally different, different world. Uh, it implies that the weather gaps are huge and there's much empty space between New York and Buffalo. Okay, now, space and construction. Both New York, both the U.S. and the U.K. have plenty of local NIMBYs in opposition to new, new building. I mean, you know, whatever 
local council opposing new, new, you know, new building that you can find in, in Greater London, somewhere I can find a place in Greater Boston where they are, you know, as hostile to anything above two stories or anything that might house poor people. We'll match you, right? It's not, it's not at all that that's not, that's not doable. The difference is that we have great swaths of America where people don't have those views where they, they are dominated by pro-growth machines that believe in building, that have, uh, you know, that have names like Houston and Dallas and you know, places that just aren't bought into this at all. So while you have areas that are highly restricted in the US, you have this great safety valve of massive amounts of uh, building that occurs. Um, and because we enable all this extra building, it actually makes it easier to abandon Detroit. Right, to abandon the other cities because you don't have this pressure for where's the housing going to come from because you know where it's going to come from. It can come from Dallas, it can come from Houston. Um, and that's not just land, it's also because these new cities have rules. And I just want to show you two, two graphs of this. So this, these, these are, this is a graph of the U.S. that I use to illustrate the power of housing supply. And what you're looking at uh, along this axis is population growth. And what you're looking at along this axis is, mean, is median housing value. So there are th basically three globs in this thing that you should look at. There's a glob down here with low population growth and low, low prices. These are our declining cities, right? These are our, our places where um, you know, growth is very, very limited. Here, we have areas where there's plenty of demand, but very little, very little growth in population, very little growth in housing. These are places in which we basically stopped housing supply, not because there's no land. I mean, if you've been to Marin County, Marin County has nothing but green space, but it's got 60-acre minimum lot sizes. 60 acre minimum lot size. So you don't get much population growth if you have 60 acre minimum lot size. Um, and over here, you have places with names like Las Vegas and Phoenix that grow like crazy, but they have low prices because they allow huge amounts of, huge amounts of building. And this is also true here, but notice the difference in growth in housing stock. So like Milton Keynes, that's 0.15, 15% growth. This is, go back to the US, these are one, this is 100% growth. Right, so it's a, it's a different order of magnitude in terms of what our growing areas allow. And that's, that's actually important. But you see the same pattern, right? You see also some declining areas over here. You see areas that are building more that don't have high prices. And you have areas that have high prices with, that build much less. Right? It's, exactly the same. it's exactly the same pattern. This also, um, I think that the constraints of many areas also explain why places that were initially pricier in 1995 have seen their prices grow between 1995 and 2013. And that's, that's been a UK phenomenon. The U.S. is also somewhat more mobile, although I think the difference is when I started looking at the data, the differences are less extreme than you would than uh, I necessarily thought at first. Um, so the U.S. number is something like um, share of the U.K. that moves nuts two regions. Uh, there are 37 nuts two regions in the U.K. So you can figure out what, you, what size those are. Um, about two percent of the U.K. moves one of these a year. The EU average is about one percent. Um, the U.S. average is actually across states, which are slightly larger, is actually about 2% now, was 3%. The most counties, which are smaller, is 6%. So we're moving a bit more, but the gap isn't huge the way that it is, say, with Italy, which is one-tenth of the EU average, right? Basically, as we know, in Siena, it's a big deal if you, like, change contratas. It's, it's considered to be, like, huge desertion of your natural culture to move to a different neighborhood within there. Um, and the reason why I'm pointing this out is it's, it's part of what makes the U.S. so mobile. Right, is the fact that we have very little of the same devotion to the space of our ancestors. And there's, there's much less, although the geography, the, the landscape, the climate is different. America is, on one level, much more culturally homogeneous, at least in terms of particular cities. So it's not like if you move from Columbus, Ohio, to Houston, you're not experiencing some huge different change in the way people talk and the accents that you hear in the, in the world that you experience. And this, this is part of what makes the US just respond to things by moving a great deal. Um, I don't think I have to say very much about this, but local services such as schooling, policing, etc., are all usually under the direct control of the mayor, right? And the mayors themselves have a second, very empowered layer of government, which is the states, which stand between them and the federal government. And pretty much whenever the federal government tries to do anything that involves cities, it has to go through the states. Um, which means that the national government can either just try to distribute cash or try to cobble together some hybrid entity like Head Start and Healthcare. Moreover, the structure of the Senate leads to homogeneous policies everywhere, even when this makes very little sense. So, you know, we have the same housing subsidy policies in Detroit that we do in Dallas that we do in San Francisco. These could not be three more distinct housing markets, right? And yet, you, because the Senate spits out the same policy, you have the same sort of policies encouraging housing in the same way. Um, and the structure of the Senate also means that it's very hard for the U.S. to have any sort of a deal where you actually you know, consciously took from one area to give to another area. 
right? There are rare exceptions which almost prove the rule, like the Appalachian Regional Commission, which also was drawn in a way so that there were something like 12 states in Appalachia, which was, which was a truly bizarre design of the thing in order to get enough senators to get the thing to work. And it was a very small-scale intervention. But the whole world of sort of thinking that you're going to have large-scale spatial policies runs into the power of senators who don't at all think that you should be redistributing across states. The one thing the Senate does like doing is spending on infrastructure. That's sort of a universal constant. And it often does that quite poorly. And, and one of the, the uh, unfortunate political bargains that occurred was the Federal Highway Aid Act of 1973, in which the, the highway boosters, because they were running out of steam, managed to build support for their act by getting a bunch of cities to line on board to get federal aid dollars for transportation infrastructure. One of them was Detroit, and this is what Detroit built with these dollars, the people who were monorail. Um, now, the problem with rail in Detroit is that it's the same problem as any structure-heavy approach to decline. The hallmark of declining cities is that they have an abundance of structures and infrastructure relative to the level of demand. Detroit was built for 1.85 million people. It now has less than half of that. More than 90% of the homes in Detroit, as of 1980, were valued significantly below construction costs. It never made sense in the 50s or the 60s for the US government to have a policy of subsidizing building, urban renewal in Detroit. And it certainly never made sense to spend $300 million on a monorail that glides over empty streets. Okay? You can run a bus at any speed you want in, in Detroit. Right? The monorail is empty. It glides over empty streets. It's there as like a, a symbol of white elephant folly of this magical thinking that we're going to put some sort of a, a fancy rail project in a declining city, and all of a sudden, things are going to come back. What really makes me angry about this is, in fact, Detroit needed help. It needed better schools for its kids. It needed better policing. It needed safety. It needed more sensible economic management policies. What did it get? It got a monorail, right? How, how utterly twisted is that? OK, now that leaves me to the advice that I glibly give in the United States, that I, I'm, you know, I think some of this is valid, but some of it is not. So, um, I'm accepting that the job of the federal government is to be spatially neutral overall, that you're not supposed to bribe people to locate in one area or another. And there are a number of reasons for this. First of all, it's politically what's going to happen anyway, or it's the best that you can hope for, in fact, politically. Secondly, I think there are real downsides to trying to bribe people to, play in, uh, to, to stay in underperforming cities. Right? It is not as if before Hurricane Katrina that the city of New Orleans was doing a fantastic job of taking care of its poor people. It was doing a terrible job of taking care of its poor people. And the idea that the federal government should spend $200 billion to try and rebuild up New Orleans when you could have given $500,000 to each family in, in New Orleans with that money felt like a very strange use of, use of resources. And one of the facts that came out of that was the work of my um, co-author, former student, Bruce Sassage, who found that the kids who were forced out of New Orleans after, after Katrina actually ended up with much better academic outcomes when they ended up having to go to school in Texas. There was actually a significant improvement in that. Um, now, there's nothing heartless about this. I think the important thing is to focus on helping poor people, not on helping poor places. What drives me crazy about the monorail is not that it was, you know, not that it was biased towards Detroit, but that it was not at all helpful for the children of Detroit. Right? And I think there are times in which we deliver resources for poor people by helping poor governments. That may very well be the case. I have no problem with using federal resources for better pre preschool uh, training in, in Detroit. But it has to be focused on what is it delivering for the children of the area. Just once I want to hear an American mayor say, yeah, my city lost 10% of its population during the last eight years of my term. But I educated my children fantastically well, and they got great jobs in Atlanta as a result of that. Because in fact, there's a lot of pride that you should have in that. And that's the more important job of local government. And that's really, you know, uh, about focusing on human rather than physical capital in declining places. And I think everything we know about the, the data that I just showed you points out the primacy of skills. That in fact, the, the hundreds of millions of dollars spent on monorails are a problem, not because the monorail is so evil, but because that money could have been spent educating kids. And we actually do know what really matters in terms of this. Um, so the human capital really is central. And, and you know we, know, we know a certain amount now about what schools really matter on this. Um, I tell localities that they should focus on attracting and training smart people and then getting out of their way. Uh, and I focus on, on experimenting with pro-entrepreneurship, pro-education policies. And one, one experiment I'm, I'm been trying to, to engage with, trying to push in Boston, is having an entrepreneurship zone in a higher poverty area. That would be an attempt to experiment with both pro-entrepreneurship you know, pro policies involving both training and, and faster, faster track permitting. Um, what I would change here, first of all, the situation is just far less desperate. And I think if I were betting 
on Manchester's future, I'm in fact fairly optimistic about. Secondly, um, and that means that investments in infrastructure in places like this look less like a colossal waste than in places that are rapidly losing their, rapidly losing their population. So I think there's, there's more here. That doesn't mean that it isn't just as possible here to waste a huge amount of money on unwise infrastructure investments. The answer here is not to say no. The answer is to assiduously focus on cost-benefit analysis, right? is to avoid the myth-making and to add up how much benefit is being created. Remember that the alternative is you can spend money on educating kids. Right? You can spend money on actually delivering something that you know will have value. Um, the rootedness of people, the fact that people are tied to places, makes the case for place-based investment stronger. So this view that, you know, just say no in the US, I think is much less palatable. <coughs> but again, it needs to be smart. It needs to be not about white elephant projects. It needs to be about things that will actually deliver value in the areas. Um, still, I think one of the, many of the best investments for place-based focus are education and entrepreneurship. I wouldn't rule out transport, but I'd be wary. And when you do do transport, think about how to connect it with human capital policies. So, you know, I, I spent a fair amount of time when I was in Paris last month thinking about the Society de Grand Paris, which is a very, you know, it's very Parisian, it's a very infrastructure-related approach. So we're going to solve all of Paris' problems by building a new rail system. Um, and it really only makes sense if you're putting new rails through high poverty areas, if you're going to combine it with intensive skill training where the people will have transportation access <coughs> and do so in a way that involves randomized controlled trials. Um, and then, you know, connections do matter. Um, and we need to also recognize the limits of our knowledge and keep experimenting. And that's, that's why I, I believe in the value of zones. And, and zones are not, it's not that I, I think that, you know, we want to have to be running what are called concession zones. Right, of, of bribing people to locate particular areas. I think we want to be running what Paul Roman calls reform zones, areas in which you experiment with things you're not sure about doing on a national level, so you can learn whether or not they work or not, and whether or not this is involving entrepreneurship training or permitting. Um, I, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm remaining not. Now, we're in the midst of a great decentralization debate. Um, and I think certainly many urban successes in the US have been associated with strong mayors who have done great things. It is also true that the handmaiden of urban decline in other places have been highly empowered local mayors who have done bad things. So I believe in decentralization, I believe in cities, but it's important to be wary on this and to be smart about it, to recognize what things are really helpful. So one of the things that would be, I think, particularly helpful, I think this, this shows this, is, is you know, making sure that there is planning authority that goes on at a regional level. I think that, that part of decentralization feels very attractive. I'll just say a little bit about what we know factually about decentralization. Most of the statistical work just comes from comparing places with lots of little cities versus places with a few big cities. So my work from the 1990s finds that there's more segregation in places that are split up more. That shouldn't surprise you. More, more political entities and in them you have more, more racial segregation. Carolyn Hoxley's work found, found that school quality improved in places that had more competition. This is, of course, because localities have control over the schools. The work of Jesse Rothstein hotly disputes that. Uh, Matt Ressinger provides a much more comprehensive look at the correlates of fractionalization, and he finds more fractionalized areas do have somewhat less growth, but that's actually not robust controlling for weather. More fractionalized uh, end up having more population and job sprawl, um, and you have slightly higher income growth. So this is actually skills growth or income growth, and slightly less population growth. So the more fractionalized places end up being, you know, having richer people but less of them. They grow, they grow less, in part because they restrict the, they tend to be more nimbyist. And that's, I think, one of the points about moving towards more, more regional planning in, this, in a sense is that you have more of an ability to internalize what saying no does to everything. Um, so I think at the end of the day, um, you know, I think there is really a possibility of cities coming back, but it has to keep a skills focus. And it has to be just as smart in how we design policies as anywhere else. <clears throat> Empowering local governments is right, but your current level of government is pretty darn good. And you want to be wary about, about losing that, about losing the really high quality of British, British national government. So be careful about this. Universities are important, uh, and they can be useful partners in, these, in declining cities. Um, and it's really important, of course, that whatever you do with decentralizing power, that it be connected with a growth of local, uh, of local civic capital. That can, that can matter with that. Because so often when we see cities come back, it's because there were local leaders who played a crucial role in combining with, with the mayors, combining with the leaders, and helping that happen. Um, and make sure that any transportation expenditures really satisfy cost-benefit analysis. And I just want to give a plug for the humble bus, which is often the ugly stepchild of transportation. But in areas that are declining, where we don't know exactly what's going to happen, 
buses are wonderfully flexible in a way that rail is not. And in a world in which we don't know what the future is, right, the ability to invest in ways that we change is really not. I think that's true in almost all infrastructure that you, that you think about. I mean, I, I just cheered for Tony Shea's Las Vegas putting retail in shipping containers, which meant that you could move it in and out cheaply. It's a temporary solution rather than permanently leading with a structural oriented thing. And again, it focuses on the view that I believe that every city can come back, but it only comes back if it puts its people first. And if it recognizes the real heart of the city is not the infrastructures, that Cleveland has not come back because it's built a few shiny, shiny towers, right? nor has Liverpool. They come back when the children in the schools have a brighter future, when they have higher skills. And that's the really crucial thing, is remembering that comeback cities are really about empowering the, the people and building human capital. And that's where urban strength ultimately resides. So thank you. Let's pause for the question. You were showing those distances in particular. I'm sort of reminded of the old lines that you know the difference between Britain and America is people in Britain think 100 miles is a long way. People in America think 100 years is a long time. <laughs> um, That's right. So on the, on the what I found really striking looking at this, looking at your, your graphs in particular, was how much path dependency there seems to be in lots of this. Cities which were growing in the 80s are growing now. Go further back. Cities that had a skilled workforce 50, 60 years ago, or doing better now. You say some of the US data right back to the 19th century. So how, when we're looking at which of these have came back, which ones haven't, how much of this is, is path dependency? You know, it depends. If you were in a good place in the past, you are more likely to be in a better place in the future. It's, it's a good place, but remember the skills also reflect, in some sense, the hangover of industrial success. So let's choose the cities of Glasgow and Edinburgh, for example, two, two pairs of uh, the, the, the difficulty of Glasgow, you know, Glasgow was a great intellectual center in the, in the 18th century. The difference is it was a much more successful industrial town than Edinburgh. In the same sense that Detroit was a perfectly smart city in the 19th century, but it was an incredibly successful industrial town. And as a result, it attracted a vast industrial workforce that wasn't particularly oriented towards you know, formal education. You didn't need that in the That ended up being a huge burden for these, for these cities. So in some sense, the, the success at this moment of being an industrial city, a factory town, ended up being a huge burden. I think in part because the, the ultimate DNA is, it, I think, about smart people, small firms, and connection to the outside world. And that's not, that's not accidental. The cities are all about connections. In fact, much of what we call being smart, but much of what we call being educated, is learning how to connect with other people, learning how to write, it's learning how to communicate, it's learning how to be. Uh, it's also learning how to have, have something to communicate. And small firms are ones that are open to the outside world because they need to be, as opposed to large firms which are, which are walled off. And cities are all about these connections. They exist because of these connections. The entities that want to be in there are ones that value, value connections. The industrial success was, uh, was to move away from this because it created something grafted, something totally unurban on top of urban form. And it grafted on it because the city created it, of course, because the city created most things. Um, and it started there, but then it ended up being a, a, a wrong detour. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, so it's not always the case, but basically you're right. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to write in history, but I think we have to believe that you can do it. And that there is enough, and one of the reasons why I made this point is there is so much in the older history of Manchester, Birmingham, Liverpool, Glasgow that is special, that is interesting, that, it, that is, you know, um, incredibly strong, that it, it's part of what should give us hope for these cities. And in some sense, it's recovering the DNA of Matthew Bolton. That's, that, that's really all about. Thank you. The second quick question. When you were looking at your differences between the US and Britain, your different policy advice, <coughs> you said very clearly in the US, federal government, national government has to be especially neutral because politically there can't be anything else. Now in Britain, we've got a strong national government and we don't have to be as neutral. So if you were advising the UK national government at the moment to the future of its city's policy, how discriminatory should it be? Is this about devolving new powers to all cities, or is this about picking certain ones and back to so, them? So I still believe that the fundamental job of the government is not to ensure that uh, any fixed number of people live in any place. I think that's as true in the UK as it is in the US. I don't think, it, I don't think it's the job of the UK government to make sure that more people live in you know, Milton Keynes, or to make sure that more people live in Liverpool. Either, either way, I think it's the job fundamentally of the government to be, you know, not to be about choosing winners or losers in terms of the number of bodies living. I do believe passionately that it's the job of the UK government, like the US government, to care about the people who live in Liverpool and to care about the people who live in Manchester. 
Manchester. I believe there is more to be said that good things will happen for the people of Liverpool and Manchester by investing in those places than there is to think that investing in place in the U.S. is likely to yield good things. I think there are a number of reasons for that, but a lot of it has to do with national government capacity. A lot of it just has to do with historic track record. If what, if what place-based policies mean for Detroit is a monorail, I'd just rather not have it. Right? It's not. It's not helpful. It's not a. It's not a. Uh, um, whereas I believe enough in the UK system that that, that that in fact there can be place-based interventions which are actually helpful, but they still need to be ultimately justified. Not about raising, you know, Birmingham's population level. That's not the point. The question is whether or not you are empowering and strengthening the children of Birmingham through these policies, and they still ultimately need to be judged on that. So I, I wanted to go as far as it goes to, to strengthen human capital in these cities and make make it better. But it's not ultimately about it's not ultimately about about reshuffling the deck. It's about lifting up the lifting up the people. Uh, so do we have a microphone going around? Or there's a question already over there. Sure, sir. So we'll take we'll take two or three times. That's right. So the first one. I'll sit anymore. <clears throat> Um, yeah, thanks very much, uh, Philip Blom from Res Publica. Uh, I wrote the original Devo Max, uh, Devo Mank, uh, Devolution report with my, with my colleague, and I'm doing a big report on Liverpool at the moment. So I was very struck by your remarks. And there's two questions I have. Um, first, on infrastructure, it seems to me that what's wrong with the monorail is it keeps people in its in the same place circulating around. It's not a connecting bit of infrastructure. And Liverpool and other cities that, for instance, aren't planned to be connected on high-speed rail fear that not being connected to connecting infrastructure will have a huge penalty for them. And I'd be really interested in, in, in your remarks uh, on that. And secondly, on the issue of universities, what, what's really interesting is the, de the debate on universities is about what type of university benefits the place. And there's some evidence uh, that actually leading world-class universities, the benefits of that doesn't necessarily accrue to place, and people argue instead for applied universities, you know, Fraunhofer-type institutions that try to create the intermediate gains. So I'd just be interested in what your view should be for the great decline in northern cities. Do they, do they need um, the, the, you know, a Cambridge of the North, or do they need an MIT? So, sorry for two. Hello. And any more? The lady back here. I'd like to ask your, your thoughts on um, a sort of more a mainland European movement for managing shrinkage. So, a number of cities in Germany have looked at how to accept the fact they're going to be smaller and to humanely manage that shrinkage. And I wonder if you thought that had potential for, for the US or perhaps more controversially for England. Well, we've already got three questions because Philip cheated and did two. But we will discourage that in the future. Um, and, you know, if one thing I wouldn't have predicted coming up the lift today was how much I'd be hearing about monorails today. <laughs> in the presentation, all the questions. Put me in mind of that Simpsons episode, which was Indeed. certainly Indeed. a bad yeah. vessel. The um, picture of the monorail always does. The, uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, managing shrinking, you betcha, right? Shrink to greatness. I think absolutely it's critical for you know many cities to accept that they're going to be smaller, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's my, that's in some sense my point about taking pride in the fact that you've educated your kids, even though you're you've lost ten percent of your population during twenty years. Being smart about it, accepting accepting it doesn't mean you're accepting mediocrity. And that's sort of part of the thing. No one's saying that accepting that Detroit is going to be smaller and that it's not being, these populations accepting the current level of Detroit city services or the current quality of life in the city. No part of that is is about it. It's just accepting that it's not the same thing to be a great city leader, to be a great city, than to add population. Population growth is not the only report card. It's going to be a particularly important report card in terms of, in terms of urban success. And in many cases, cities need to right-size themselves. And that means, again, shrinking intelligently. So you know, I strongly concur that. Um, what kind of university? You know, I think I hinted at this already with my kind words about MIT relative to, uh, to Harvard. Um, I think the track record certainly of five universities is pretty good. That doesn't just mean about what skills are being taught, so you know, engineering being you know, particularly valuable, but also about what research is being done. And the work of Naomi Hausman uh, shows that when the United States, and they, prior to 1980, if you got research support from the federal government, you were not allowed to commercialize it. 
that changed after the Bayh-Dole Act of 1980. And what happened was a great flowering of entrepreneurial activities around universities in the fields that they had traditionally been good at. Good at. So I think that it, it's reasonable to sort of have a focus not on, um, not, not on, on things that are likely to be, be in some sense job producing for the local area. I mean, it, it's not to say, look, I, mean, I, I believe in learning Latin, I believe in you know, all, the, all the glories of, of a traditional liberal arts education, but they're not necessarily sensible things for trying to supercharge the economy of a declining region. Right, that's, that's not why we're being um, The um, uh, Lastly, connections. Uh, okay, uh, here I think I'm less clearly friendly with it. Um, yes, there are many things that are wrong with the people who are moderate, but I think in the track record of transportation being oversold is enormous which does not in any sense mean that I am opposed to all transportation expenditures in any way, shape, or form. But it just means we need to be wary and to make sure that really serious, independent analysis is going on about it. That's, that's a fall point that's on that. And I think that's, I stand by that. I also, by the way, stand by that on regulation. I think one of the great, you know, the great bizarre things is that we, you know, occasionally undergo cost-benefit analysis for things like rail infrastructure. We never do for land use rate. When have we ever, when has there ever been a, a single cost benefit analysis on all the sight lines for St. Paul's that are projected? Just to throw out a, 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 a random, a random thing. Okay, I'll stop on, I'll stop on that one. Um, getting, getting controversial there. Uh, any more questions? Can you take the gentleman at the front? Uh, one, one variable you didn't mention is urban population density. Is it irrelevant to the story you're telling? No, I mean, urban population density is related to this move to the car, and certainly to, through much of the 20th century in the U.S. Americans left denser areas and moved into less dense, less dense areas. That has largely <coughs> reversed itself in the successful cities, where, in fact, we see many dense areas that are, that are thriving. Um, but, you know, it, it still remains true that the move to the car was associated with that move away from those areas. I think the point about density, you know, I spent a lot of my life thinking and, and worrying about density is that wonderful things happen with density, but bad things also happen with density, right? So when we're close enough to, you know, connect with one another, we learn from one another, we, can, we are better people because we are able to, to <laughs> sum up each other's wisdom, to be the intellectual magpies that, that you know, human beings are, to steal ideas from our near neighbors, which is, you know, what, what, what's another word for intellectual progress. Um, but we also, when we're close enough to each other, we're also close enough to exchange and contagious disease. We also congest each other's roads. Uh, we also, you know, have to crowd ourselves in a smaller space. We put up the noise pollution. We put up a whole lot of densities. These downsides are real. Um, and the the battle between the upsides and the downsides of density is very much the story of cities over the past thousands of years. Um, and indeed, the, if we think about you know, what cities were like in the late nineteenth century, they were cities of Productivity, where people sacrifice pleasure, they put up with those downsides of density to get those extra earnings. And that's very much what the industrial town is about. That's what the fact that a boy born in New York City in 1900 was seven years less than the national average. That gap is the same in, in Elizabeth London. Right? A very substantial life expectancy gap, reminding us that clean water is the most important job of every city, of any city government. Um, because in fact, it's the clean water that made the largest difference in reducing those, those life expectancy gaps. Um, um, over the course of the 20th century, the host cities became much healthier and much safer. And the successful cities, the ones with lots of skilled people, the ones with finance, were able to invest in ways that uh, enabled the cities to become safer and more fond and so forth. In many of the poor declining cities, they continue to have the downsides of density, never had the hidden resources that enable them to trans transform themselves. So these things are, are real, but I think the point is that you can handle density if you have enough resources and if you have good enough government. But in Singapore can manage whatever density it wants, it'll be fine. It's in Singapore and figure out a way to make it work. But if you're a poorly performing American city, you can't. And that's, that's you know, that, that remains the issue. Thank you for time for another few quick questions. Um, two across the area, in fact. Can we have woman and the man in front of me? Just tell us your name, where you're from, quick questions. I think probably. What do you have time for? Hello, my name is Bethany Hogan. I work for um, the London Bridge Business Improvement District. Um, and I was really interested in your point about the greatest investments you can make being in entrepreneurship and education. And I wonder how that applies in an area like this, which is almost on the flip side of the declining cities argument, essentially that there's huge investment here, but there are 
you know, there's a super output area across the street where people are in really high <coughs> poverty, and how you can ensure to make, for that, make sure that that investment actually reaches people just down the road, essentially. <coughs> Duncan Neesh from the Institution of Civil Engineers, and I'd love to have a conversation about transportation investment. Um, but I'd rather ask about, uh, maybe because of that, I'd rather ask about um, political leadership and path dependency. Uh, I wonder if you've studied the extent to which places which are declining, which maybe have a, a large legacy industrial workforce or ex-industrial workforce or ex-workforce, to what extent do people actually vote for the types of things that you are talking about, or do they actually vote to, uh, for people who make their kind of difficult situation more comfortable and opposed to helping them to move out of that? It's a, it's a great question. So there, there are, um, I would, I would say, so let me, let me start with that before I, before I get to the, um, the, the, the this is a good place to, to end. But again, the, 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 if you want a sort of broad picture of uh, American cities and, and their leadership, you want to start with the view that there was, you know, in the bulk of the 20th, 19th, 20th century, there was a battle between good government, anti-corruption types who typically represented rich people, and urban political machines who typically represented poor people. And, uh, the urban political machines were actually about doing stuff to help poor guys, but they were also about stealing stuff or doing other things as well. In, by the 1960s, you had a rise of a very, you know, uh, uh, hopeful, uh, optimistic moment of mayors like John Lindsay in New York or Jerome Cavanaugh in Detroit, who were sort of Kennedy-esque and thinking that they could solve all the problems of the world at the city level, and they were elected in this great, this great Kennedy moment. Um, they overpromised and in many cases underdelivered because in fact cities are not good places to solve all the problems of the world. Cities are good places to deliver basic city services. Um, and then there was a turn against them. And the turn against them happened in a variety of different ways in different places. So in some cases what happened was there was a tip towards majority, uh, minority leadership. Sometimes which produced excellent mayors, sometimes which produced mayors who were in the old mold of ethnic fighters. So had plenty to be resentful about, but ended up in many cases leading towards more conflict within the city and failing to deliver on basic, on basic services. Um, and other cities turned more towards, and that's the New York story, towards centrist, pragmatic mayor managers. Um, and that's Ed Koch, that's Rudy Giuliani, that's Michael Bloomberg, where it was sort of realized that the city had reached its limits and needed to retrench. It needed to, needed to, uh, needed to move back. So I think there's a lot of heterogeneity about it, and, but, and it also reflects, I think, in part the skills of the city, that there's a very strong connection between corruption at the state level and the skills of the state, and um, that's probably not surprising us. And, and I think if there is, is anyone raising an engineering record who really can take issue with the view that we want good cost-benefit analysis for transportation, I, 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 I have trouble believing that. Um, on the issue of how do we help these cities with incredible inequality, and I, I think this is a great place to, to, to end, because this is certainly the London and New York and Boston and San Francisco issue. Um, and these are, you know, these are places that both have shown incredible promise, but both have had poverty around us all the time. And the first point that I always make about this is that cities should never apologize for the poverty. Cities have rich and poor people because cities are good places to be rich. As we all know, London is a spectacularly good place to be rich. Um, but they're also relatively good places to be poor because they have better social services, because they have the ability to get around with a car for every adult. My own work with Matthew Kahn finds that poverty rates go up near new subway stops, which is not a sign that the subways are impoverishing people nearby, but rather they're attracting people who want the ability to get around without a, without a car. Um, cities attract poor people with the promise of economic opportunity overall, and that's something that cities should never apologize for. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean that cities should in any sense be comfortable. With their, with their inequality, as long as they don't react to it by trying to zone out poor people, right? So in the same sense that suburbs should not be proud of the e equality that comes from making it impossible for poor people to live in, live in their areas. It's a huge obligation. We don't know how to fix it. And that's, in fact, part of the big issue with the inequality debate. The answer is not just taxing the rich, because that doesn't solve it. We actually don't know fully how to work things. We know that education is part of the answer. I think that entrepreneurship is another part of the answer. And this is why I've been you know, trying to work on this innovation district in a higher poverty area in Boston is to have something that was experimental, targeted both towards skills and towards, towards innovation that can try and see more of what works. But I think that is very much the challenge ahead, is to try and make sure that these cities deliver on their promise, not just for middle income or upper middle income people, for, but for people at the bottom as well. Because even though cities should be comfortable with inequality, they should never be comfortable that inequality becomes permanent.
they should never be problem. Unless that inequality is constantly producing upward mobility, then there's a big problem. And certainly that's, that's I think, the goal ahead is to make sure that the mobility that London has always meant is true in every borough of, of London and is also true in Liverpool, Manchester, Birmingham, Glasgow, Glasgow as well. Because that, that mobility, that upward lift is really you know, the most important. Thank you. I think mean, the only thing that reminds me is two things. Firstly, to invite everyone to have a drink in the reception area outside. And secondly, to ask that we thank you in the traditional way.